pastor is away um, with Gwen. Uh, Bridget is uh, not able to be with us this morning, but Gwen Anderson has graciously uh, uh, offered to do this morning's worship service. And so let's begin the service this morning. And uh, why don't we open with a word of prayer? Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to worship you. We pray that this service this morning will be glorifying. We pray that um, through this opportunity that uh, we may reach other people, not only here, but also through um, the online service. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Stephen couldn't come either because Atticus isn't feeling well. So it's just me, and we're going to try some hymns. So I know it's been a while, but grab the white hymnal. Sing the under the chair. And sing as loud as you can because I haven't played hymns in a while. <laughs> so just sing, sing loud. And the first one is 210. Uh, not, not page number, that's the hymnal number. Yeah, 210. We're trying to kind of still go on the theme of resurrection, because Jesus rose again, and that's something we've celebrated more than one day in the year. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Say it loud. Yes, yes. Please stand. Please stand. All right, Jesus paid it all. He set this up.
Thank you. You may be seated. Just a few announcements this morning. On uh, Tuesday is the men's Bible study at 7 and Thursday women's at 7. And uh, the prayer opportunity through the phone is still available on Wednesday at 7. Uh, if you need that number, let us know. Um, and I think there may be any other announcements. Did I miss anything? No, I don't think so. I think we should continue to pray for the Ukrainian people and the struggling they're, the struggle they're facing. Uh, there seems to be some victory coming along, and we hope that um, God works in his miraculous ways. Um, we have one more song, and after that, Peter Gatto, who has uh, graciously come to uh, provide the message this morning, is going to be with us. Some of you know Peter, some of you may not, but he was here in the past in Mount Bethel as a youth pastor. And now, of course, he's the executive director of the uh, Recovery Hub, uh, or our hub. And that's with Grace Bible Church. I think it's still Grace Bible Church. Yeah, yeah. we're separate from that. We're separate by our own entity. Okay, great. <laughs> so Peter will come right after that uh, next song, and then uh, we'll have the message. So. Okay. Um, 402 in the white hymnal. Uh, Christ the Solid Rock, we the Solid Rock. <laughs>
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> is, is this actually working? Should I probe pro this out, or is this microphone here good enough? Uh, microphone there should be good. One, two, okay, that should be fine. I think it's fine. Well, it's an honor to be here again this morning, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity to come down here and spend time down here. I love coming to and having the opportunity to come and share every so often. I'm grateful for the relationship that our families had with, the, with many of you here and the church as a whole over the years. It's been an absolute blessing, and we thank God for it. And also grateful for Pastor Michael and just... His willingness and his open arms toward myself and our family, our ministry that we're starting, uh, has just been awesome. So I'm really grateful to each one of you, grateful to um, to uh, Mount Bethel Baptist Church as well for just a long, a long relationship that has been a beautiful thing, you know. And so, real quick, sometimes people are, so how are things going with the recovery ministry? What's going on? Well, we're about ready to move out of our, um, our home where we live right now uh, in Parsonage and uh, Chester, and we'll actually be moving out to a farm that is kind of going to be a central piece for our recovery ministry, where we will minister to, to men who are coming out of a, a uh, destructive background, and uh, by providing them with a life change program in the context of a farm. And so we're just grateful. There's been a lot of miracles that have happened to get to this point, but we still, uh, we cover your prayers because we're just moving down that road and uh, we have some challenges on the way. Really cool thing about what's going on with the ministry even now is that we are seeing a lot of life change happen in our support groups. We have about eight support groups that meet each week in three different counties, and we also do what's called recovery coaching. So we come along people who are just trying to figure out what the next steps are in their lives and walk alongside them in that process of getting them connected with resources and support group and so on. So that's kind of the update on Recovery Hub, and I'm grateful. Oh, we have a banquet coming up on May 21st. It would certainly be awesome to see a couple of people from this congregation there. There's invitations out on the in the foyer. If you have any interest in knowing more about our ministry, you can just sign up on the newsletter there, and we'd be happy to begin uh, communicating with you on a regular basis. So, amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray as we open up God's word this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for the loving God that we are. We thank you for this new day. We praise you, Lord that you are risen, that you are alive, and that you are moving and working in our lives and even in all around the world. We praise you for the way that you speak to us through the creation. We just thank you as we uh, experience seasons here in this area of the world. We just give you glory for the way that we see life coming up uh, all around us, uh, that the cold winter, in a sense, has come to an end, and now we see new life uh, just... Um, sprouting and pushing its way uh, out of the winter into the spring and on into the summer. We give you glory for that. And uh, we give you all the praise. We pray this morning also for Pastor Michael and just praying that he, uh, all that, that you have for him today, Lord, that you bless him, that you fill him, that uh, he would return back to uh, refresh, uplifted in your name. Amen. All right, so this morning what I, I uh, was thinking of... Uh, focusing on this morning was actually solitude. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about solitude. We're going to talk a little bit more about like, kind of like our inner inner uh, life in Christ and the importance of that. And um, it's just been something that's been very near and dear to me over the past year, especially just growing in uh, my practices of solitude, prayer, and meditation, and so I just thought I would just share a few of the things that God's been teaching me, and hopefully in some way it'll be an encouragement to you and your walk and your relationship with God as well. I want to start with a story um, from a book that's called um, the, Pl the Palace of Nowhere. It's written by a, uh, a monk, and in, in, this, in, this, uh, in his book he he really points uh, to the necessity.
necessity for us to establish what he calls a clearing place uh, uh, for God in our lives, in the midst of the everyday struggles, in the midst of our inner and outer struggles, in the midst of the pace that we live in, in all of the realities and those things that are pressing in uh, on, on, our, on us at any given time, to create a clearing space, a place for God. And so I love this, um, this analogy that he draws from one of his own personal experiences in the monastery where he himself studied to become a hermit. Um, so so here, here it is. Uh, here's a little story from this guy by the name of James Finley, who um, was studying at this particular monastery. He said, from time to time, out in the monastery there, a forest fire breaks out in the wooded hills surrounding the monastery. When this would occur, the monks usually joined with neighboring farmers to put out the blaze. On one such occasion, I was in a group of novices being led by Merton over the hills with brooms and shovels to put out the fire. Suddenly, just as we were approaching the fire, we could hear the angelus ringing in the distance. Now that's a bell that would ring out of the monastery. They would stop and they would pray every time that bell rang. <clears throat> so, at the time, the custom was for the monks to say the angelus by facing the church, kneeling, bowing over, and placing their knuckles on the ground. Much to my surprise, upon hearing the angelus, Merton yelled out, Stop! Let's all say the angelus! And so with the flames in the near distance, we knuckled down and silently prayed. The very idea of it made me laugh. It all seemed so incongruous. Praying there while the flames crackled and spread through the dry grass and leaves behind us. But then it struck me that prayer is always incongruous. Unless we are willing to knuckle down before the flames, we will never truly pray. The forest of our activities, plans, and projects burns with demands, deadlines, and the threat to consume us. There must be a clearing made for God. There must be a time for nobody within us, the nobody within us, to sit down in the nothingness of simple awareness and humble prayer. Oh, I just loved it, that little story. It just uh, struck me. I hope in some way it encourages you. And... Um, you know, so I think for me, when I hear that, when I hear that, it's very real to me. I can really relate with the idea of the forest burning, the demands. You know, sometimes things that feel like they're going to consume me, right? And his encouragement is, you know, to make sure and, and to establish, and you know, a clearing for God. A moment uh, on, a, you know, somewhat of a regular basis where we knuckle down and we just, we, we go into the presence of God. And we, we uh, enter into that place and we stand there in prayer, completely and utterly in need of His help. But that that place be established in our lives on a regular basis, every day, um, that we might stand in the midst of, of, of what is a very uncertain world with the assurance of God's presence and protection in prayer. And um, anyway, I just kind of love that. So when I think about solitude and, you know, Jesus saying, you know, that the scripture is so clearly saying, you know, in Jesus' life as he walked the face of this earth, that the demands and the people who were around him and the needs that were around him were always pressing in, right? But then we hear that there was this sequence, this pattern in Jesus' life over and over where we read the, you know, those words, you know, and Jesus, and early in the morning, Jesus woke up, right? He left the house and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. In the midst of the fire, Jesus knuckled down and spent time with the Father. And for many of us, as we've read and we've studied the scriptures, we can see that this pattern in Jesus' life was almost kind of like the secret, connect, not secret in the sense that he was hiding it, but the place of secret, the solitary place that he would go in the midst of everything going on in his life and the incredible call that was upon his life. Right? As the Son of God, he went away to that secret place and he knuckled down with the Father and spent time alone with him. And somehow, as I know, I read the scriptures and I look at Jesus, like, somehow out of that came his strength to face the needs of the day, to face moments such as the cross. 
It was his intimate time alone with the Father that fueled his life. Let me read things like Jesus said, you know, uh, you know, his food was to do the will of the Father. He didn't do anything except that which the Father told him. And so this intimacy and this solitude and this alone time with God was at the center of Jesus' life as he showed us what it looks like to be fully human as you walk the face of this earth. And a big part of that is learning to get away in solitude, knuckle down with the Father, spend time in His loving presence, hear His voice, allow Him to, to meet us, our deep needs that we might be able to, you know, that we might be able to live and that we might be able to um, face the challenges of the day, but also love those around us to be a vessel of love and a vessel of grace to the world around us. we got to be connected to the source, right? And that source is Jesus. The more time we spend there, open before Him, transparent before Him, and allow the Spirit of God to touch us deeply in our deepest center, right, in our heart, the more that we become like Him and we become a vessel of His love and grace in the world. Like, it gets all kind of mixed up for me. Like, the wires get kind of crossed when I'm out there and, and I'm out and trying to go through my life and being a vessel for God, but I haven't spent time with Him. Like, it still kind of makes its way through, I think, because He's gracious, loving God, and He uses me despite my weaknesses. But when I am spending time with Him on a consistent basis, drawing on His love and growing in that intimate relationship, it seems to just flow a little bit better. <laughs> I seem to see myself, the world around me, and my relationship with God from a much better perspective after I've been in His presence. And, uh, and so my encouragement to us this morning, yeah, is just like, you know, I hope that we're encouraged to, to knuckle down, to make that space, no matter what's going on around us, that that becomes and continues to be a priority for us in our life. That we listen to the longing within us. Not the, not the guilt that says, you know, you're a bad Christian, you don't measure up all we already know Those things are actually all true apart from the work of God. But it's the longing inside of us to honor the longing inside of us to be in God's loving presence. To, to, not, to not push that to the back, but let it come up and may it motivate us and push us into intimacy with our Father. Um... So a few things about solitude. Uh, I know for me, when I hear of solitude and I think of Jesus' life, which we're kind of reflecting on a little bit this morning, you know, a lot of times it seems like it's like an escape from everything. You know, I'm going to escape from the world. I'm going to escape from the pressures. Um, and we were kind of talking about this as the thing that will fuel us to stand within, with, in the midst of them. But truly, like one of the things that has been really helpful to me over the past over the past year, and I think over time, is just that solitude is, is really it's really a place of transformation. It's not simply being alone. It's being alone. Good morning. With God. Being alone with God. Being alone and being alone with God are two totally different things. Um so, and many times when we come into the presence of God and we spend time alone, we become aware of our own weaknesses, our own brokenness, our own struggles, the reality of our uh, fallenness in, 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 the, uh, in our humanity. And, you know, and sometimes we want to run away from that, but really solitude you know, as, as, as those who have gone before have practiced, is a place of transformation and communion with God. It's not just time alone. It's time alone just as we are with God, our Creator. So um, one of the things that I've been doing over, is that I've been studying the, the Desert Fathers a little bit. It's been a lot of fun for me. I, I really appreciate the, their writings and and, and their teachings. And I want to read a little excerpt from uh, one of the books that I've been reading that really struck me. And it really speaks to this reality of coming into the presence of God 
and having the, our facade, you know, kind of pulled back, having the masks taken off, um, becoming completely transparent before God, and being aware of the fact, like Isaiah was when he came into the presence of God, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. Woe, woe is me. I am a man of many unclean things. And so, uh, that in solitude, when we begin to get alone with God on a regular basis, we begin to realize, you know, that we just don't have it all together. But here, but this is a story. St. Anthony, the father of monks, is the best guide in our attempt to understand the role of solitude in our spiritual formation. Born around 251, Anthony was the son of an Egyptian peasant. When he was about 18 years old, he heard in the church the gospel words, Go and sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then come and follow me. Anthony realized that these words were meant for him personally. After a period of living as a poor laborer at the edge of his village, he withdrew into the desert, where for 20 years he lived in complete solitude. During these years, Anthony experienced a terrible trial. The shell of his superficial securities was cracked, and the abyss of his iniquity was open to him. But he came out of this trial victoriously, not because of his own willpower or his ascetic exploits, but because of his unconditional surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When he emerged from his solitude, people recognized him in the qualities of an uh, recognized in him the qualities of an authentic, healthy man, whole in body, mind, and soul. They flocked to him for healing, comfort, and direction. In his old age, Anthony retired to even deeper solitude to be totally absorbed direct, in direct communion with God. He died in the year three, 356 when he was about 106 years old. I really like this story about Anthony because I can really relate with it so much. And I think it, it really paints a picture of the reality of my own brokenness and my own nothingness and my falling short. This, this, this term, you know, that here, here was Anthony, you know, he's kind of drawing away. He's like, I'm going to draw away from the world. I'm going to get alone with God. And the, the, the first thing that happens in that, in that quest, in that struggle, is that he is, you know, faced with the reality of his own brokenness. Like it says, the abyss of his iniquity was opened up before him. Like he could somehow see the depths of his own depravity in the presence of a loving God. Right? Like this is what the issue was. I come to spend time alone with God, but now that I'm here all of a sudden, and I'm trying to stay in quiet in prayer and meditate, like I become aware that there's stuff inside of me that is not all that uh, easy to, to reconcile. It's there. It doesn't just go away when I get alone with God. In fact, it comes to the surface. And so like he sets a pattern for us here. He was victorious in that trial, in that battle, just as we are, through the sufficiency of the cross. Through the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. There was only one way for Anthony to have reprieve or peace or be comforted in the reality of his own brokenness and separation. And that was the cross of Jesus Christ and surrendering himself to that. So in, in solitude, then, come, then he comes out of there with the grace that he was given to share with the world. Going into solitude is kind of drawing away and be alone with God, coming face to face with the reality of our own abyss of iniquity, and then being opened up again and again and again to the sufficiency and the love and the grace of Jesus Christ as the sole solution for the dilemma of our soul. And as we go through that process over and over, the death to life process of the cross, in moments of quietness like solitude, we, we come out of those places 
Again, we're aware of his love for us. We're aware of our need for him. And somehow in the mix of that, God equips us to bring that out into the world around us, into the relationships with our children, into the relationships with our spouses, into the relationship with those we go to church with, into the relationships of those we stand in line with at the store, and on, so on and so forth. We become, we, we, we start to grow in our capacity to understand the, the difficult struggle of, of humanity and the grace and love of Jesus Christ that holds us in it and through it all. Amen. Right? Amen. Um, so Anthony's testimony, you know, it's really cool. I think this concept, you know, when we get up, solitude is not just being alone, it's being alone with God. Solitude I like to define it, have been defining it a little bit more like transformative communion with God. It's a place of transformation. Um, so when we enter into solitude, and, and the, those who've gone before us, as we, you know, we look toward Jesus, we look toward folks like the Desert Fathers who drew away and were very serious about their solitude, we, can, we see that... that that in solitude, not only did they become aware of their brokenness and this abyss of iniquity, but they learned to embrace it. They learned to embrace their very nothingness apart from God. And out of that emerges, again, this depth, this ever, ever growing depth of the love of God, the reality of the love of God that sustains us. As we let go of every single other uh, you know, facade or hiding place, and we open ourselves before God. Again, what do we find? We find that our God <coughs> loves, accepts us, sustains us, holds us up um, in and through it all, and continues to pour Himself into us in the reality of our nothingness, in the reality of our brokenness. Thomas Merton, I, I like his readings. He's a Trappist monk. Maybe you've heard of him. He's a bit well-known, obviously, in like spiritual formation circles. You may have seen his name in books that talk about prayer and meditation. And what he said, he said that solitude is the place where we let ourselves be brought naked and defenseless into the center of that dread where we stand alone before God in our nothingness. Without explanation, without the riles, completely dependent upon his providential care, in dire need of the gift of grace, his mercy, and the light of faith. Amen. And so it's this encouragement to us, and, and, and you know, as we pursue solitude, as we pursue to make a clearing for God, and as we continue to grow. In, in our walk and relationship with God in, in, in and through solitude and getting away that we begin to come without any resistance toward the things inside of us that we use to actually hide behind and or uh, to cope with the deeper issues that are going on inside of us whether it's from trauma or uh, from any other type of a, we always use the word hang up, uh, habit or hurt that may be within deep. Um, and so it's this idea of not coming with any resistance to this, but coming and embracing this. I, I've been trying to lately when I get into my quiet time is to start off with my core wound. <laughs> it's like, let's, let's just, Cut to the chase, like, I'm afraid, I'm afraid that I don't measure up, God. You know, I, I deal with these fears inside of me that do come from trauma, they come from my own poor decisions and a whole bunch of other stuff, but it's deep within me that there's this lie that exists that, that, that wreaks havoc on, on me in my interior and exterior world when, when, it, when, it's, when it's not rightly placed into the hands of my loving Father. Um, and so instead of resisting any of this, it's like, God, let's, I wanted to start this morning right out with like, let's, uh, my wound, my, my wounds or my wound, or and then any, anything that I can, uh, the Holy Spirit enables me to identify that I'm actually using as a tool to cope with like, that's actually like a shield or resisting his love. 
you know, as the sole source of my security and identity. Anyway, kind of pretty deep stuff, but that's what Merton, you know, and these others are saying, you know, kind of teach us in these moments before God. So not only is there a brokenness there, not only are there things there that um, I'm using to, to uh, you know, other than the, the infinite love of God in, in my life to cope with life and so on and so forth, but embrace the nothingness. Embrace the nakedness and, and, and be open, open up my, my heart, open our hearts to our desperate need for God. Amen. And, 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 and allow that, right? Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, and it's there where we begin. Uh, there's a, another uh, cool visual that I uh, have um, you know, meditated upon and reflected upon that I think also really uh, helps us with this idea of allowing ourselves to come naked and defenseless before God. And it's written by a guy by the name of Dr. Douglas B. Steer. He's a Harvard graduate. Uh, he's known as a Quaker at heart and a man passionate about transforming power of prayer. And here's how he relates this, this uh, these truths that we're talking about, this idea of coming defenseless before God. He, he relates it to old-fashioned theater. He says, in old-fashioned theater, there were often three or four fire curtains with lively scenes painted on them. At intervals before the play began, these painted curtains were lifted one after the other. As a member of the audience, I was never quite sure whether it was still another painted curtain or the very play itself that was before me. But finally, the last fire curtain lifted, and now there was nothing between me and the actors themselves. Real prayer must have many curtains that must rise before we are in living touch with the play itself. The real play, the true self, is found in the presence of God's love. Amen. 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 I love these pictures. They're helpful to me to grasp the, these, these, these truths that we're talking about. And, um, I mean, it can be quite convicting, and it is to me, you know, like, my, my prayer life, with, you know, with, he's kind of suggesting, is like this, actually, the, 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 the real play begins when the shields have come down and and uh, all of these fire curtains that I may have in my own life. I'm sorry, when they're lifted. When they're lifted. And it's just me and God just as I am. It's kind of when the play begins. It's really powerful stuff. I find it to be very liberating. I find it to be very challenging as well. But the liberating part of it for me is that it's there when I am, just as I am, as God has created me with all of my humanity, not trying to hide any of it, just as I am with God. Like, isn't that how it started? Yeah. And sometimes it gets awfully complicated. But yet that's actually where, where we were meant to be, where we were created to be. Our true self presence of love and living in that way. It's pretty powerful stuff. And I love it. So it's not about me putting on a, a facade for God. It's not about me trying to hide things. It's more about a process of allowing the, you know, the layers of the onion to be peeled away over and over and over again. And entering into, over and over and over again, the grace that flows from the cross. The love that says, I love and accept you as you are. No strings of over and over again. And it's through that we become grounded in God's love. We become grounded in God's love. It's been said that the best that the, the way that we can, you know that we glorify God most is by being the person he created us to be. And in that is a mixture of humanity and deity as the Holy Spirit is within us and we're united to Christ. So often I'm so ashamed of my humanity and the things that I struggle with. It's not like it's a license to 
sin. But yes, yet we live in a relationship where there's no condemnation. And coming to grips with the fact about my personal struggles and then my personal strengths and who I am that God has made me to be, and, and then also through the redemptive work, right? And with the Holy Spirit coming in, I'm a new creation. Well, that's who, this is who I am. Sometimes I try to be someone I'm not. I am, I am learning that the nothing that I am in the presence of the loving God is way better than the something I am not. In other words, my accepting my nothingness apart from God and accepting and embracing His love for me, being nothing more than a man loved by God, Lord is, God. is way better. Amen. Amen. Is way, way better than the person I try to be. And uh, anyway, so we embrace our nothingness. Embracing our nothingness. Um, we're absolutely nothing uh, apart from the love of God. In 1 Corinthians 13, it kind of focuses in on this a little bit. Um, I, this is a scripture that we're also familiar with. We call it the love chapter. And uh, as many of us have heard at weddings over and over, as we maybe counseled, ourselves and others, maybe you are in relationship, significant relationships with maybe marriage or maybe going to be married, kind of kind of hang our hats on the love chapter and talk through, you know, what is love? What is it about? You know, and um, yet there's a, a, a piece of this as I've meditated on it and uh, been learning that it really speaks also to the reality that we're nothing apart from his love. We're kind of just talking about this idea of embracing the nothingness, about not be, be defending ourselves or trying to have a defense in the presence of God in any way. And here Paul like, just lays this out, that we're absolutely nothing apart from the love of God. So as many of us have heard this before, I want us, we're going to focus in on this, this, this word being nothing and empty apart from it. Right? It says, if I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. And so we've all heard this a million times. So I'm sure maybe we have. Maybe maybe some friends new for some of us. But I can stand up here and talk all I want, and, and uh, you know I might even be able to pray in some other other language. But if I have like if I don't have love, it's it's empty. It's just empty. It's what Paul's saying. It's nothing. And then he goes on to say, if I have the gift of prophecy and I can fathom all mysteries and and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but I have not love, the scripture says, Paul says, I am nothing. Then he goes on to say, if I give all I possess to the poor, and I subject my body to hardship, so that I might boast, but have not love, I gain nothing. It's very powerful, I, and I think that I, I, it's great that we focus on the love because ultimately that's what sustains us. Ultimately, it's that which gives us purpose, value, life. <laughs> but at the same time, the reality of, of embracing the fact that apart from it, I'm nothing. That actually births my desperation for God in a big way uh, in, in my heart. When I become, when I allow myself again to be in this place that I have dire need of the love of God and the grace of God and the presence of God in my life, right? It's there that, that I begin to begin to experience this love in deeper and more profound ways and established in it. Well, this understanding that like I'm nothing apart from God's love, you know, it, it, it creates a longing in my heart. It, puts, it helps me to get to that space where I realize apart from Him and apart from His intervention, his action, his love, his work in my life. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, on walks, talks with God, meditating and praying and thinking on this, you know, I realize that I can't even exist. None of us could even exist right here in this moment apart from God's love. If God stopped loving us for even a second, you know, a, a mill of week, you know, by the time I counted to three, we would all cease to exist. Because, right? Because we're nothing apart from him. We can't even live apart from his love. We can't breathe apart from his love. We can't exist apart from his love. Everything that we see around us is a, an expression and an extension of his love. So anyway, just getting in touch with that. 
and being getting started to become a little more comfortable with the reality that apart from us, but at the same time being grounded in the reality that in his love that I have everything, that in relationship with Christ, that I'm in an inseparable relationship with my God who loves me and who gave himself for me, right? Amen. Whose love is limitless and uncomprehendable, right? That that it's we don't stay in the we, we were we were created to stay in the nothingness. We were created to know and live in a relationship with a God who we can uh, who who is filled with an immeasurable love. Who 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 touches us and meets us and pours himself Lord into God, us yeah. and gives us what we need on a moment by moment basis to not just walk through life, but to walk through life as a individual created by a loving God who is held in that love, who is filled with that love, who is the recipient of that full love, who cannot be loved more, cannot be loved less. Amen. Right? Amen. This opens Amen. us up to the reality of God's sufficiency. It opens our eyes to the reality of that. The fact of the matter is that you are loved, that you are created in love, that you are held up by love. Lord and then all of the, the, the devices that I try to kind of use to prop myself up in this life, yeah, they're all worthless, right? And the only thing that really has any value that's going to be last, long-lasting is the one thing that will endure forever, and that's love, God's love, Amen. God who is, the scripture says, Amen. love. Anyway, I pray you catch a picture of that. It's death to life. It's, uh, it's you know... It's nothingness to every immeasurable everythingness. In Christ, in God, it's a beautiful thing. And we become grounded in it over and over as we, as we allow solitude to be this place of transformation. What time am I supposed to stop? <laughs> Four. <laughs> Four. <laughs> uh, all right, I, I, I'm just going to close with the yeah. other comment. Oh man, praise the Lord. Amen. 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 Love by God. Amen. You know, I, my, my goal anymore is I, I really like I have these opportunities to come be here with you this morning. God allows me to opportunities to have an opportunity to share in his word, but I, I want to come in the nothingness that I am so that I can stand in the love of God. You know, and not something of my own. Some performance. The biggest trap for any of us, I guess, for somebody who's in ministry is to perform. Perform. You know? Awesome oh, performance is like death if it's not, if it's not, if I'm if I'm trying to do it in my own strength. And I neglect this deeper life that we're talking about here this morning. And it's the same for any of us. You don't have to be in ministry to struggle with that, right? Yeah. It, it's it's like uh, you know, again, the someone that I am not. You know, or the nothing that I am is much better than the something that I'm not. It's it's ceasing to try to be anything other than that which God created me to be. And it's the discovery of this. We can all say we're image bearing beloved children of God. But the discovery, the internal discovery of the reality of our sonship in Christ is the journey. And uh, it's not just for it to be here, right? It's for us to, 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 to learn to walk in it in the fullness of all, of the brokenness of it all. No one does it perfect. It's a journey, right? It will be fulfilled, right? Uh, when we pass through the veil of death and enter into the full expression of God's love, where we don't see through a dim glass anymore, but we see clearly, right? And we're known as, uh, you know, we're known as we're fully known. But we know as we're fully known. Anyway, so as we as we look at solitude from through this particular lens that we were talking about here this morning, and uh, we begin to get grounded in in God's love. You know, Paul in the book of Ephesians. I love this prayer. This is a prayer that I uh, I, I love uh, to pray over my family and uh, over those that are in my ministry. We're familiar with this prayer, but 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 Paul really passionately, you know. Praise this prayer over the people of God in Ephesus, and here now this prayer is so relevant to us in 2022, right here at Mount Bethel in Warren, in Warren, in Warren, not County, but the actual Warren. He says this, Paul says to the people in Ephesus, 
For this reason, I kneel before the Father. And so he, this is Paul saying, here is the reason by which I go before God on your behalf. He was, you know, for this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you be rooted and established in love. This, this, um, this, the, the whole prayer to me is an amazing prayer. But here's, Paul is before the Father. He's on his knees. He's crying out to the Lord for the believers there. And we cry out and we pray in the same way that, that we would be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love. Solitude is one, one of, I think, the primary ways in our spiritual life where we become grounded in the love, where we become grounded in that love. And then it happens on ever, ever, uh, you know, like ripples in, it, in, it, in the pond, ever, ever increasing moments. And it happens in solitude, it happens outside of solitude, it happens as we're walking down the road. But each one of those moments is constantly circling us back to this reality that we've been talking about today, that we are completely and fully loved through the blood that was shed for us at Calvary in every and any circumstance of our human life and existence, from birth, life, to death. And it circles us back and grounds us. He circles us back and grounds us and roots us in that love. I think for me, I've, I've been preaching and teaching for a long time, and I can talk about love. But I, 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 I have a desire, my, 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 not that I can fully talk about it, I'm just saying I can, I can, we can go to the scripture and talk about it. But it's, 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 um, it's convicting to me, or it, it, it's something that is heavy in, in my heart, is that so many of us who are coming to church, who are following Jesus, who know all the truths, have never taken the time, or not, or we're not taking the time, and I do myself with this, is to be grounded in the love by returning to it, like we're talking about in solitude, over and over and over. And we become grounded in it. Soon it begins, little by little, to become the reality of our life. Anyway, Paul's praying for that. I'm praying that you would be rooted and grounded and established in love. You know, may you have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide and long and high is the, it, and deep is the love of Christ. You know, like Paul's praying for the believers, and this morning we pray for one another in, in this space, in a sense, from our hearts. And we say, you know, I, I pray that you guys, you know, that we all are, are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and that we're accessed in the deepest centers of our soul by this immeasurable love of God. That we would, even though we can't know it because it's infinite and it's far beyond us, it accesses us, it touches us, it, he, he fills us. And so the prayer here for Paul is, I pray, and I pray for each of us, that you, you and I, at some point along the way, in our time of quietness along the way, that we also are able to experience the depths and the height, the breadth, the length of this love that goes beyond comprehension. And then he says, I pray that you will be filled with the fullness. And so, just returning back to the reality of that love and the grace of the cross over and over and over in our lives, it helps to uh, ground us in that love, in this inseparable union that we have in Christ. And I'll close with this in Romans 8, 30. 8 and 39, uh, you know, here we see Paul speaking to this reality that we are in a inseparable love relationship with God. That there is a union that has been established between Christ and us through the cross by faith that can never, ever be separated, ever. It is something that God established through Christ when we were born again. You know, the old is gone and the new is here. Amen. At the cross Amen. I was crucified with Christ and now yeah. I no longer live, but he lives in me. The person I once was, the person Peter without God, died. Now I'm, now I'm nothing but a man loved by God. 
Does it mean that I still don't struggle with issues and have a human side? Not that I don't have issues with that I have to work on. When I say I'm dead, what I no longer hear is just that, hey, the old is gone. This dude, Peter, who was walking around before Jesus, he doesn't even exist anymore. This is new guy. It's the Peter and Christ version. And it, 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 not perfect. Obviously, you all know that. But anyway, nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Glory Christ Jesus. God. Amen. The union that we have in Christ, that we are one with Him, can never, ever be broken. Amen. And when we put our... Our, uh, you know, we, we seek to find our security and our identity in this inseparable union of <coughs> love. We begin to become grounded upon it, and and we begin to become grounded on the very thing that already is sustaining us. So what does Paul says? He says, "For I am convinced, I am convinced that neither death nor life." This is like heavy stuff, right? Many of us have experienced the pains of death, watching loved ones die, and we realize that, that, that we're all going to face this, this, this thing called death. We're, but, but the reality is that not even death, and he says life, or anything that could happen here on this life, can ever separate me and you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Amen. I like love never fails. And this was so important to me when my sister died in a tragic car accident. Several months later, her son dies from COVID complications. Like dad died. Like all of a sudden, like, whoa, like death begins to like start to like have new new meaning to me. Love never fails. Neither life nor death. Whatever's coming at you right now, whatever's coming at me, whether we can, you know, get this all up in here in our mind at all the times or not, the fact of the matter is that we are completely and fully secure in the love of God. Nothing can separate us. Not Lord even death God. itself. Death is just a Amen. veil. It is just a, it is a door that opens us up into the Amen. completeness of that love. It doesn't come to an end. It consummates the love. And it's, uh, you know, it, this helps me, a person who struggles with fear, that, you know, hey, nothing can separate me from the love of God. I thank God that it's in His Word and it's true and it's not contingent upon my feelings, but that He's real and that in every moment of every day, there's not one second that goes by that His love will ever fail me or you. Yeah. And He goes on to say that never, neither the present nor the future or any powers can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. So whatever's going on in the present, whatever the future may or may not hold, and whatever powers that exist upon earth, seen or unseen, can never separate us from the love of God. Amen. You know, I, I struggle against the fear. I struggle with fear of man. I struggle with fear of people. I struggle with fear. So, so this is my grounding, right? Thank God for the reality of His Word. Ah, nor anything else in all creation, He says, neither height nor depth. The immeasurable expanse of the entire cosmos itself cannot even separate us from God's love. Man, this is good stuff. <laughs> you know, we'll never be able to separate us from God's love. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, that's my closing comment. And just, in, you know, is briefly concluding, right? Solitude is not just being alone. It's being alone with God. Amen. 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 Make an unashamed. Solitude is, uh, is a place where we experience in that space, in ever-deepening ways, the sufficiency, the depth of this love that created us, sustained us, and is going to con and be consummated when we meet here to be with Him for eternity. So maybe be encouraged in our walk with the Lord and in pursuing some time of solitude and letting, you know, taking down the um, the barriers um, and allowing him full access to our to our to ourselves. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, praise you. We know that every word that is spoken is really only can be used of you to move us beyond the words and to move us into the reality of your presence. 
that is closer to us than we are to ourselves. Even now, sustaining us, pouring you pouring yourself into us. Oh, we give you glory. Father, thank you that when we're undone,